Can you introduce your friend and our friend, the great Dieguito, Diego Mendez Vosito of from course. Mexico? Of course, why not? Uh -huh. Dr. Uh, Diego Mendez is the next uh, speaker uh, with a very nice uh, lecture. Dr. Diego Mendez is the chief in the National Center, 20 de Noviembre at Mexico City. And uh, his passion about the school-based tumors specifically uh, has produced in Diego uh, a very, 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 very uh, wonder, uh, famous fame. So Diego is our friend. But Diego is a very good uh, tumor surgeon, and he's gonna give the next uh, lecture. I hope, and I, uh, I'm sure everybody's gonna enjoy. Diego, please go ahead. Thank you, thank you very much, uh, Jose Antonio. And first of all, I would really like to to thank uh, Dr. Borba for his. Uh, friendship and enthusiastic uh, uh, role in, in teaching uh, before the pandemic and now with the pandemic, he's done a great job uh, with this uh, new system that is here to stay. And even though in the near future, I'm, I'm sure we're gonna continue having some, some virtual, virtual uh, uh, teaching, okay? So today uh, you can see my screen, right? Today, we're gonna to talk a little bit about pituitary surgery. Uh, I call it a 360 degree perspective. Why is this? It's because, oh, first of all, no disclosures. Uh, we have to understand that, that to treat pathology, uh, we need to have a, a 360 degree perspective because we're gonna do whatever, whatever our patients need and every, uh, and every case is different. So I like to call it in a, to study the pathology in a 360 degree way. To study and to do what we do, uh, for, for me, it's very important to, to understand where we come from. And where is that? The pituitary surgery, it all starts from Pierre-Marie, Pierre -Marie, who described the acromegaly. Later on, Victor Horsley, who did the first uh, pituitary surgery. It was a transcranial, transfrontal approach. And uh, it started developing all, in all the history of, of the pituitary surgery. It was later on until 1907 when Hermann Schlaffer did the first, uh, the first transthenodal pituitary surgery, which is very different. Well, it's, uh, the, the surgical approach is different from what we do today. But uh, he started to develop that, uh, that uh, surgery. And it was until Harvey Cushing popularized the, the, the surgery, the transpenoidal surgery. And, uh, and he did his first in 1909. He used a, a translabial surgery. He, do, he used the lower corridor. Meanwhile, Oscar Hirsch did a trans, he was from Vienna and he did a, a trans, uh, transplenoidal route, and they popularized the surgery. Uh, it was, uh, by that time, they had, they had a lot of limitations to visualize, no, no, illuminate, no good illumination, no magnification, no diagnosis. And so uh, it, it's, it, it was a very clinical diagnosis, I mean. And so the thing is that after sometimes, some years became the dark era in transplenoidal surgery. It was almost, uh, almost 30 years that Harvey Cushing did not do a transplenoidal approach. And it was because this uh, Norman Dot, who was a, a, a student from Harvey Cushing, who learned the transplenoidal, the transplenoidal route, um, who taught it to Dr. Guillot from Paris, and he did as well to Jules Hardy. And so because of these three uh, great surgeons, Norman Dodd, Gerard Gio, and Jules Hardy. It's what we call the resurrection of transplenoidal surgery. And they evolved by, uh, by having some, uh, Gerard Gio introduced the X-ray in surgery, Jules Hardy introduced the, the microscope to transplenoidal surgery, improving the illumination. 
And so this is what today we have as a normal transphenoidal root. And uh, that was part of, the, of this evolution. Later on, after some years, there were some other amazing surgeons, like I, I cannot put everybody here, but we also have Hakuba and many other great surgeons as Professor Almef, Vinko Dolenk, that they, they brought a skull-based boom is what I call it, that we had a, a great improvement of the surgical techniques and, the, and the, all the surgical approaches to expose different types of pathologies. Later on, uh, in the mid 90s, uh, Carrao and Joe, they did the first complete uh, trend, uh, endoscopic approach. And it, but it is also to understand that Gerard Gio, he had already introduced the, an, an endoscope, an endoscope in the transpenoidal surgery, but they did it for the first time, a complete, a complete, uh, 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 a complete approach. Later on, uh, in Italy, in Naples, uh, Professor Capabianca and Davitis, they evolved with, with larger approaches. And it was not until the endoscopic revolution that I would call it, uh, that the UPMC group and people that are still there and that have evolved to other places, that they became with an endoscopic revolution. Why is this all important? Because we have to understand that we have different uh, tools, that we have different armamentarium from skull-based approaches, from endos endoscopy, from radio surgery, and it's all the evolve, the evolve of the of the development of the of the evolution of, of neurosurgery. And so, for on we have to understand the, the 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 anatomical also the anatomical relationships that we have with the nasal of the nasal cavity and the relationships with all the surrounding areas, uh, because we have we're gonna have all the relationships with the anterior fossa, with the cavernous sinus, with the carotid, and we have to understand the complete, the complete pathology. For example, in this case, this is a 59-year-old patient with acromegaly. She, she had double vision and she had this tumor. It's a small, uh, it's a micro adenoma uh, uh, pro that's producing uh, GH. And, but we have to understand the closeness that, the, that this uh, tumor is going to be to the internal carotid artery. And so if we understand the anatomy of the region, now we know that we have to do this type of craniotomy in order to complete and to do the, the, the approach. For example, in this, uh, in this case, we are exposing, we know that we have to go very uh, over the carotid artery in order to have e enough exposure. At this point, we are drilling above the carotid artery. There we are using a microsurgical Doppler in order to identify the carotid. We have to have enough exposure in order to have a, 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 the surgical maneuverability to dissect the tumor. There we are opening the dura and as you can see, we like to open the dura in a, in a straight uh, incision and to always preserve the, try to do an extracapsular dissection. If we do an extracapsular dissection, it is going to be the, the, our, the, the capsule of the tumor is gonna be our best friend in order to, uh, uh, to dissect it uh, freely. At this point, it is very important to, we are opening laterally the dura in order to have a, a, a good uh, space to maneuver. And as you can see there at that point, we, can, we are seeing the, the, that we are working outside the capsule of the tumor. And so it is very important to, to try to dissect it in a 360 degree fashion. Uh, and so, Always, if you get inside the tumor, it's very important. There we are seeing the lateral wall, uh, the medial wall of the cavernous sinus, of the carotid. And the important thing is that even though you go, I'm sorry, even though you go inside uh, the, the tumor, you always preserve the capsule of the tumor. You don't want to rush into removing it uh, uh, because you can leave a, a, a small piece behind. As we can see here, 
This is the great advantage of endoscopy that we are seeing inside. And we can see that there is a residual tumor in the higher part of the tumor, or in the higher part of the, of the, of the, of the, of the cella, the, the cella region. And there we are, even though it's in a piecemeal fashion, but we are preserving and we are always identifying the, capsule, the capsular tumor, the capsule of the tumor, as we can see here. Okay. And so we continue and then we can see that we are removing the complete, the complete tumor. And that is the case of a, of a micro adenoma. Okay. There we can review it. This is the pre-op, the post-op. And the most important thing is that we here, we have the post-operative labs, which is she is uh, cured. This is another case. This is a very similar case, but it's uh, Cushing's disease. The patient had a lot of, of, of uh, clinical manifestations. And this case was particularly important because, because this uh, tumor had already been operated in a previous, in another institution. Since it was already operated, uh, we, we also, it was very similar to the previous one in where we had to do this complete uh, uh, exposure. And as we can see, we have a more fibrous tumor and the importance of this, of, this, uh, of this case for me is that always you have to be prepared uh, uh, that uh, in, in more in a redo uh, to, for example, as we can see here, we are starting to have a leak, a CSF leak. And so it is very important, but anyway, it's always important to dissect circumferentially the tumor and preserve there we have, we can see the leak and preserve the, 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 the capsule of the tumor in order to remove it. That is the only way that we can improve our, our uh, laboratory results in functional pituitaries and uh, to remove it in, in, in a one, try to remove it in a one piece uh, tumor, which is, which is not always possible. And then we can go again inside and always inspect and review inside the tumor. We can see the carotid, the medial wall of the coronal sinus, and it looks empty. And this is the post-op and also the cortisol, it's in good uh, conditions. So she is also cured. This is another case. For me, it was an uh, uh, interesting case because it's a very high tumor uh, and it has this uh, narrowing uh, of the dorsum of the, of the cella. It's uh, this narrowing, it's gonna, it's, it, it can become a problem and not allow us to remove the higher part of the tumor. We can see that this tumor is pushing up the, all over the foramen of Monroe and the septal and the uh, cerebral internal vein, it's also displaced dorsally. And so uh, for this case, uh, but we can see that it's, it's, it's a very high tumor. So it's a complex thing. Uh, the, in, if we um, understand the anatomy of this tumor, we know that it's going all the way up and it's going to be very close to different, uh, to different, uh, uh, to different uh, uh, vascular pathology, but to different vascular structures. So it is very important to understand this and uh, whenever we, we take care of those, uh, take those precautions. We decided to do an endoscopic uh, approach. Uh, this is the, we have to know very well the anatomy to be prepared in this case for, for a nasocephal flap. And so there we can see that we have the septum, we do the, we are, uh, the, our ENT team, uh, Clara Palma is doing the, 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 the approach there. And we can see the rostrum of the sphenoid. Uh, and, um, and now that we can expose completely the tumor, we can identify our surgical landmarks. And uh, we're, there we could see the, the optic nerves, who, who, which are the landmarks, as well as the carotids are the landmarks in the, uh, in the, in the, in, in our endoscopic view. 
it's very important to do a complete and a very wide craniotomy. The, in this case, well, it's, it's, it's mostly uh, disturbed by the tumor, so it's very thinned. And I like it to be, uh, to open it in, in an 11, with an 11 blade, that has to be like, because of its sharpness. And to do a thin opening of the dura to preserve the, the, the capsule of the tumor. And this is going to allow us to do a better dissection of all, of all the, as I was saying previously, the, the capsule is our friend in the microadenomas. Well, it's also in the, microadeno in the macroadenomas that it's very important to, in order to not to leave a residual. We like to open the, the, the dura and then punch it out with a kerosene punch and continue opening it as wide as we can in order to have a very wide uh, uh, opening of the dura. And uh, to preserve the, 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 the capsule is very, very, very important for us. At this point, we can, we, the, 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 our main objective is not to go directly and debulk all the tumor, because if not, we're going to have uh, the, the, the coming down of the, of the dorsum part of the tumor. And so it's very important to make sure and to do a circum circumferential uh, uh, dissection in order to check out our safe and, and normal uh, landmarks. As we can see there, I'm starting to see at the dorsum of the cella a, a normal tumor, normal structures. And so it is very important to continue doing that in order to uh, not to leave a residual. Because if you just start debulking and debulking, you're gonna, the, the tumor is gonna, uh, uh, the, the lower part of the, the higher part of the tumor is gonna come down and it will obstruct your view and obstruct your dissection. At this part, we are identifying the medial wall of the cavernous sinus, which, which we can see here. We can see that the medial wall of the cavernous sinus, and we continue the dissection. And we don't start removing the higher part of the tumor until we are completely sure that we don't have any residual in the lower part or in the sides of the tumor. At this point, we can start doing part of the dissection, it's always important to, to see that the thin uh, dura, it's, it's uh, as we can see there, any residual in the, in the higher part. And as we advance in the, in the removal of the tumor, we can continue widening the, the, our window, our surgical corridor, as we can see here. And so we continue we continue with the dissection. Always, never forget to always come back to the sites because that's where a lot of times you can have a residual. And after you can, after it is safely removed, you can continue and uh, and and continue to see in the higher part. It is I like to to do a, a careful dissection, but always also trying to push part of the tumor in order to, to, in order, there we can see some part of the capsular tumor and the differentiation of the capsule and the, and the, and the part of the tumor. Okay, now we are continue removing. It's, we have a high risk of, of not bringing everything down, but with, serve, with some of the maneuvers like this one, that it's kind of pushing the tumor in order to make it down and to widen the, 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 the stenosis of the diaphragma of the cella, we can allow it. And at this point, we are using the two suction technique. And there we can see that we have the capsule completely coming down. And this is the end of the, and now we can see that we have a, a, complete, a complete removal and we do a reconstruction and, and, and move it down. And this is the post-operative result, and this is the pre-op, and this is the post-op. 
then we can see that we have some other pathologies, we, some other cases. For example, this is a huge um, a case that it's invading all the skull base, invading the cavernous sinus, and it's also having a, a high part of the tumor that it's in intimate relationship with uh, vascular structures, which is which is uh, very uh, uh, kind of uh, in in a way risky. And so, for in this case, we have the we can see that the exposure, that the involvement into the cavernous sinus, and we have to again to understand the anatomy that we are going to to expect when we remove this tumor. And so we know that this tumor is going to be involving the complete sphenoid sinus, but it's also going to be eroding part of the of the of the dura of the of the bone in order to uh, act to to involve the the cavernous sinus. In this case, we do uh, from the we use, obviously start with a nasoceptal flap that uh, also our ENT team does, and uh, I'd like to emphasize in this case the importance of doing the circumferential, the, uh, circumferential dissection in order to identify the, 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 it's difficult to identify the capsule, but identify the limit of the tumor. So for example, in this case, I go to the, to the lateral parts of the tumor and I, and I, until I see that capsule and I see that normal part of the tumor. And when we forget about the tumor, our main objective is not the tumor. Our main objective is to dissect the structures. So I, I remove and I do the debulking of the tumor mostly to, to let me have some space in order to, to identify the structures. We continue with the dissecting of the circumferential dissection of the, of the, of the, of the tumor. Uh, we can see that there's the, 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 the capsule back there and I start to see the carotid. And uh, it's very important that we are using uh, uh, the micro Doppler and uh, the bone is thinned in this, in this region, but it's very important to remove it in order to allow us to have a wide uh, exposure, as we can see here. And uh, at this point, we are starting to remove tumor that it's going to the cavernous sinus. We can see how it go, it sees through, uh, through the dura. And so we know that it is safe there to open the dura then. And at this point, we did a, 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 a transsteroid approach in order to have this exposure, this lateral exposure, and we continue removing the tumor. Uh, it's very important to, to, at this point, to identify the, the, the structures, to be careful to use instruments. We can see there the carotid, we can see here that we have the, the exposure of the carotid, there it is. And we are working there in the pre-ICA space. We are working inside the cavernous sinus, inside the cavernous sinus, uh, anterior to the carotid artery. And, and uh, we use uh, uh, instruments and, and uh, in order to go to the lateral sports, we use uh, angled instruments, I mean, and also a, a 30 degree endoscope in this moment in order to expose, to expose good the carotid. I like to use a, a, a patty in order to push the, the, the capsule of the tumor, allow me to push the capsule of the tumor. And at this moment we are seeing the complete, the complete exposure of the carotid, uh, which is exposed, uh, we're using the angled instruments, which is exposed from the foramen lacerum in order to have the, the complete exposure of the carotid. Um, using also the, the maxillary sinus uh, uh, suction, it's, it's important. It's important in order to have a wide exposure and a wide dissection of the, of, the, of the tumor. At that moment, we are working behind the carotid, and so we are in the post-ICA part of the tumor. 
and it is important in order to avoid having a, a leak there, in order to, to have this patty helping there in order to retract until we see a normal, a normal, normal tissue. We can see that we have the complete exposure of the, of the ICA from the foramen serum all the way to in the complete cavernous sinus. Then we continue to have a, a, to work behind the, 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 the artery. I'm going to go a little faster. And to work in the cavernous sinus from the contralateral side. It is very important uh, to preserve the, 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 the arachnoid. And at this moment, we are identifying the dorsum, the, the clivus, and it's the dura, which was completely eroded by the tumor. And also we can see uh, There we can see the meningoepiphyseal trunk of the of the the meningoepiphyseal trunk of the of the of the of the carotid uh, of the uh, cavernous segment of the carotid, and later on we do we just put the uh, a flap and the the flap and the reconstruction by our ENT team, and so this is the result the postoperative MRI. And we can see the pre-op, the post-op, uh, which is a, a, a nice residual, a nice, uh, a nice uh, re removal of the tumor. And we're gonna just watch out uh, this small piece of tumor, which is back in the in the posterior part of the of the, of the cavernous sinus. This is another case, which is a, a big case. Uh, it's a pituitary adenoma with with a different kind of, of exposure. We can see that this case is very posterior part. It's a very, very posteriorly oriented, all the way, uh, uh, all the way to the temporal lobe, uh, uh, to the parahippocampus, and it's very high, uh, high highly positioned the uh, tumor. So, what do we do in this case? Uh, because of the position of the tumor, we we know that this tumor is going to be strictly related to the uncus, and we know that it's gonna be very high riding tumor. So we have to do obviously a, a transcranial approach, but in this case for us, it's a, it's a good case for a orbital zygomatic. We do this kind of incision and uh, we, can, we do a craniotomy in a two stages. We do a terrional craniotomy and then we do uh, orbital zygomatic uh, 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 because it is going to allow us to remove the higher part and the most posterior part. This removing this orbital rim is going to allow us to go all the way back without any obstruction of the of the of the of the of the, of the optic. I'm sorry for the sound. And uh, here we are doing. Uh, uh, I'm sorry. In this moment, oh. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. There we are doing a, a, a transylvian. We are opening the the sylvian dura, the sylvian fissure. It's very important to open it sharply. To all the way down to the vallecula and to have a, a wide uh, CSF uh, drainage. And uh, at this moment, we are opening the, the fissures, the cisternas, the carotid cistern. And we can see that we have the carotid artery, 
we have A1, we have the optic nerve, we are dissecting. We are dissecting the, 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 the optic nerves and the chiasm. And we have, a, we, here we decide to do a third ventriculostomy in order to have a wide exposure and an adequate drainage of CSF. And as we can see, this tumor is going way back as I was telling you before. So we, we decide to, the, the, to section the, the, the stenoparietal sinus. And we can see that we have an exposure. We, have, we can see here the optic tract. And this is an area that's gonna be more complicated because of, its, uh, because of, uh, of all the, the perforating vessels. So we decide to do in this case a trans uncle approach and we have part take out part of the of the uncus and there we can see and expose a, a large part of the tumor okay and uh, there we continue with the dissection we do a, a dissection all over the the for taking care of the of the vessels and and we remove this part of the tumor And we can see the, the surgical bed. And this is the post-operative result. We left a little piece that was very stuck to, to some perforating vessels at that region, but the patient did really good. And so the point here is to see that there are some different types of, types of tumors. All, for example, this in the superior vitary fissure, we went and did a peeling of the middle fossa. This is the anterior clinal process. And we have in the superior orbitary fissure, this tumor stuck here. And, uh, uh, and this is, for example, this case. This is another case which had an exophytic uh, segment of the tumor with the, with the vessel encasement. And uh, this other case is a gigantic case. So at the end, what I, what I want to, to, to the, mens the message I want to say is microsurgery is the soul of neurosurgery, and it should be achieved always in a 360 degree perspective. It doesn't matter if it's endoscopic, it doesn't matter if it's, if it's uh, open surgery, it should always be a microsurgery technique, and, uh, and the other ones, the, the, the endoscope, and these are only another instruments that we use, but the technique, it has always to be microsurgical. And this is our lab and our, I want to thank our, our fellows who have been working in this coronavirus time, full time in our lab. And so we are very thank you, thankful for, for, for this and thank uh, Dr. Borba for letting us share our experience here. Thank you very much, Diego. Thank you for wonderful presentation. Very nice case, very difficult case. You see, see if it's possible to do in endoscopic in the skull based surgery. And there is Dr. Brian, he's already he's here. Oh, Dr. Shamdu is here. Yes, I'm here. Uh, okay. Uh, I don't know if you want to start. Well, I thought you have two questions here before you give the, the word for the panelists to Dr. Shambler. Uh, can you read, Brian? Maybe it's easier for you. <laughs> Okay. <laughs> one is Dr. Philippe, Philippe Constanza, the other one is Anna Lucia. Go ahead, please. Um, one of the questions uh, is, what is the basis for blood tests to detect the genomic signature of certain tumors? Yeah, so it really depends on the cancer and the blood tests to detect any signature for GBM is very, very limited. Uh, there are a few ex experimental protocols out there that have been moderately successful, but it is much less so than for most solid cancers, 
where circulating tumor cells now make up a large part of the diagnostic and the monitoring uh, of those cancers. This probably represents a better um, to try to derive uh, those tumor specific molecular signatures from, and that's what we're starting to see uh, in terms of both looking at free DNA uh, and things like extracellular vesicles. And just to add to that, there, you know, as Lola had mentioned, there's a, a, a great deal of uh, effort in the liquid biopsy space, both ourselves uh, at Mass General as well as others are looking into this. And um, I, I think the future is bright for it and potential. Uh, obviously, it's easier than CSF, but it's a great question and certainly hopefully one that will have an answer soon. Um, Dr. Borba, I'm looking for the other questions. I don't see them on my... Yes, yeah, there is here for from Felipe Costanzo, probably from Italy, or some Italian that is living in Latin America, or US. <laughs> Can he, you read he, the question? He, I can't see yes, it. Yes, I try to read it. I don't know if, if she, she can understand my English. <laughs> you have notes during GBM surgery that wherever you enter the ventricle, the 5 LA, extend the ventricle wall even if the MRI doesn't show any alteration with 5LA, okay? The question is, do you think that your findings regarding supraventricular zone would justify the use of intratecal chemo for GBM? Nice question. Yeah, yeah I think it's a great question. Um, you know, so far, every agent that's been tried with, for intrathecal delivery has not been successful. Um, and a lot of that may have to do with the way those agents are able to diffuse into areas like the subventricular zone. So just. Mm -hmm. Oh, go ahead. Go ahead. Oh, Somebody. Okay. <laughs> Sorry. Um, and so, you know, that, uh, certainly there's been a lot of interest in intrathecal chemotherapy delivery for a long time in glioma without a lot of success. And it may be a matter of not using the right agent, but I think that there's probably more to it in terms of the ability for the whatever that agent is to actually diffuse into um, the, the region of interest. Uh, what you've described in terms of demonstrating 5-ALA fluorescence uh, along the lining of the ventricle is absolutely true. That's something that we see as well. Um, I think it begs the question, when you see that, do you take that? You know, we used to really have a little bit more debate about whether or not we wanted to widely open the ventricle, um, and we do. At least I do in my practice now, and I think that that you know if you see tumor there radiographically or, or with fluorescence, that um, that absolutely should be resected. But the reality is, of course, that that probably is ex that, that those tumor cells are probably extending into a zone far beyond our surgical cavity. Dr. Barbara Nettel from from Mexico. Go ahead, Barbara. Thank you. Uh, good evening to everyone. Uh, congratulations, Dr. Chambliss, for your presentation. It's, it was really, really good and interesting. And I have a comment and a question for you. Uh, the first, my comment is about that we, we did in our, in our department an analysis about our glioblastomas and the relationship with the subventricular zone. And we find uh, uh, we did this uh, with uh, making a comparison with the uh, paper by Dr. Uh, Lim and Dr. Berger in 2007. We used the same similar zones. Uh, and we found that the most of the patients of us, uh, more than 60% of the patients have the tumor not in contact with the subventricular zone. And our, our uh, kind of progression was uh, most of them uh, in the, in close to the, to the tumor bed. And uh, we found that, that uh, only 40% uh, of the patients have contact with the subventricular zone. And, uh, but just 2% of the patients have, uh, between 2 and 9% of the patients have uh, progression, uh, uh, distant progression at, at the time the, the tumor recur. And uh, we have uh, our, our uh, uh, progression-free survival 
in this group of patients was uh, 13 months. That is, uh, 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 but it's not the same as is uh, reported the most of the time in the literature since the, the, the overall survival is between 15 and um, 18 months in most of the papers. So I think uh, we, we could not still do a, a, a research on that, but I think our, our population is, has different, have different um, uh, molecular uh, presentation of the tumor since we have uh, results very, very different. Uh, the, I, I have commented this with uh, Dr. Berger also, and we're looking uh, forward to do a, a paper, a, a, a clinical trial on this uh, to go deep, more deep in the molecular characteristics of our patients. And now we're working on the uh, same uh, uh, trial about uh, the relationship, but uh, with the subventricular zone, but in low-grade gliomas to see if this uh, can uh, uh, give us some light about why some of them progress in short time and why uh, of, uh, other patients with low-grade gliomas have a longer uh, time to progression to a high-grade glioma. That is a, uh, something that is not... Uh, uh, well, there is too much uh, to know about that that uh, is not uh, really in our hands right now to, to describe. And uh, my, my question is a very short one, is about um, which is your experience with the TT field treat, uh, because uh, we don't have that in Mexico, and I really, I, I do not believe so much in that kind of treatment, even though other, other uh, uh, friends in U.S. have told me that they have good results, but uh, which is your, your, your experience with that kind of treatment? Yeah, I think I've tried not to be dogmatic uh, in how I think about it. it. I don't fully understand the biologic mechanism through which it's it is purported to work. Uh, and so I think, you know, I like many uh, people in this space first heard about it and thought that that must be a placebo effect or something that we're seeing. The reality is the data, um, you know, certainly supports that it appears to be um, significantly more beneficial than one would expect from a placebo effect. Uh, and so I present it to my patients as an option that we discuss up front. Um, I tell them that I personally don't think I have a great handle on exactly how or why it works, but that, um, you know, there's increasing evidence that it does play a role and may offer them some additional uh, benefit and the, the risks and downsides for most patients are very low. So most of our patients at our center tend to opt not to use it, uh, but it's certainly something that we offer up front with that type of explanation. Okay, because it, I know that it's a very expensive treatment also and uh, the, is it uh, covered by the insurance in US? I think it is covered by some because it's no longer considered experimental. Uh, so I think that a fair number of insurance companies do cover it now. Uh, and my, uh, the harder thing I think actually is patients um, get frustrated doing using it and shaving their head every day and that sort of thing. So we've had a fair number of patients that, are, that use it for a while and then uh, kind of fall off after a time. Okay. Thank you very much. Congratulations for your talk again. Dr. Shambles, let me ask you something. Do you know if there is something more impact than the radical removal of a GBM today? There is other fracture is more impacting the result than the radical surgical removal of the lesion? Is anything more impactful than that? Yes. Yeah, so, so not, probably not. Uh, radiation is probably equivalently impactful for high, for poor risk GBM. Um, radiation might be even more impactful for lower grade gliomas. Uh, I think that the jury is out on that. But when you look at the uh, amount of time that a therapy gives to a patient beyond uh, what they would have with no treatment at all, surgery and radiation are pretty closely tied. Chemotherapy uh, with temozolomide, much less. And then those other 
experimental agents uh, and things like TTF um, tumor treating fields still less well described. Yeah. But I, thought, but I believe that this ventricular zone is related with the radical extension of removal. Mm -hmm. But as deep is more difficult is to remove. See? In the other question, see, and you see a lot of neurosurgery in the US. Not, not so many in Europe, not so many in, in other countries, doing brain surgery for a glioma in very large centers with loop and no microscope. Hmm. And now you have 5LA. <laughs> How do you make the 5LA with loop? See, that's a good question. So yeah, <laughs> there, you know, other types of scopes, so endoscopes and exoscopes can have um, the same type of filter put on them to use 5ALA, but I'm not aware of anything that you can use just with your loops uh, or just with the eye to make a fluorescence work. Um, to me, the microscope is, you know, the key component of, of doing those surgeries well. Um, that, that's the way to, for me to identify the margin of the tumor. Um, and I think for people training now, I think it's really interesting, trainees now, may become very reliant on fluorescence uh, to help understand the margins of those tumor resections, which is something that took us, you know, many, many, many years and a lot of repetition to learn. So I actually try to teach my trainees very intentionally about that and get take something to the point where they believe they've taken the whole margin of tumor and then use the fluorescence to try to study that. I can always say for the young people that the best loop is the microscope because you yeah. have a lot of light you can increase the, the image also. Is it? You wanna <laughs> wanna say something here? Yeah. Yes, Dr. Borba. What's your yes, yes, Brian. Yeah, yeah. Go ahead. What's your take on ultrasound use? Good. For her? The the ultrasound, Lola or Dr. Borba. Dr. Gerardo Quinto. Hello. Uh, What's your experience uh, with intraoperative ultrasound? It's, it's very useful uh, in, in my opinion because it's the only the only option to operate yes, on in real time you know it's time. the only in real time because even mri intraoperative mri is not strictly in real time because you have to move the patient out of the or, or, or stop the surgery and and, and to to make the the, the the study but ultrasound is uh, very useful because you can apply it directly when you are finishing the removing the tumor. But of course, it's only in, in, in GBM. In, in benign gliomas, it doesn't work because it doesn't mark any 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 limits of the tumor. But I think it's a very good option, the, 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 the ultrasonic uh, 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 apparatus to, to, to remove, to, to get a more ample removal of the tumor. I have a question. Go ahead, go ahead. I have a question for Dr. Chambliss. Thank you very much for your presentation. Excellent. Which do you think is the next step? And I mean, in the treatment of, uh, of GBM and in the, in the real in the effective treatment of GBM. Uh, a lot of papers are coming about uh, immunotherapy because uh, maybe the, the, this tumor could be similar to, 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 to melanoma, another ectodermal tumor, and it's very promising in melanoma. And a lot of research are, are doing now. So do you think is, 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 this is the, the next step in the, in the, in the armamentarium of, of treatment of this tumor? Um, that's a tough question. <laughs> I, think, I think that the, and the data coming out on immunotherapy and checkpoint inhibitors is pretty underwhelming. Um, I think there was a tremendous amount of hope because biologically there seems to make some sense uh, in, in, in terms of the activity that we've seen in similar types of neuroectodermal tumors as you described, but the clinical trials data just really isn't that overwhelming. So I think we're dealing with a situation where it's gonna be gene therapy um, and probably some kind of locally mediated therapy like that, which is why I think surgeons have to really work to remain very engaged in the process of research and this disease. Because uh, I think we're going to be re required to be a, a big part of the team for treating it, regardless of what that, uh, it, even when it doesn't necessarily look like resection is the mainstay of treatment anymore.
Well, that's, thank you, Lola, and thank you to everybody. Um, I, I'm just reading through to make sure there are no additional questions. Dr. Dr. Yeah. Ramirez mentions, um, is it a good strategy to open the ventricle when you do a fr frontal lobectomy from the, for glioblastoma? Yeah, so I'd be interested to hear what others do. My, my personal feeling is if the tumor takes you there, uh, then you open the, you follow the tumor, you take, open up the ventricle and, and you take as much of that ependymal lining as appears to be clearly involved. Um, so I don't, I don't try to stop short. Of course, if the tumor is in the frontal pole, uh, you know, I wouldn't pursue it beyond what I think looks like obvious tumor, but I'd be interested to hear other perspectives. Brian, do you have different thoughts about that? No, I think that's exactly the, what I do as well. Um, if it takes you there, then, you know, being aggressive. And I, I really do believe IDH mutant or not, uh, gross total resection is the goal, um, provided you don't hurt anyone. Um, and I think Dr. Borba had mentioned it as well. Um, I agree. Did, does anybody else have any thoughts? <coughs> there is one controversy today in the low-grade glioma that Professor Dufo is giving to the world, the supramarginal resection. You see, remove the tumor and more you, maybe the half of the head, okay? <laughs> and do you believe that for GBM, it could be effective if you make some difference? I, Dr. So Chambliss? I have mostly been on the side of believing in the supermarginal resection. And part of that's where I, I did my fellowship training with Charlie Tio, who certainly has that philosophy uh, and, and had some incredibly good results um, and long-term survivors. So I've tended to take that approach for non-dominant and frontal tumors, for example. That being said, I think in the last couple of years, the literature is really maturing to demonstrate that that probably doesn't make much of a difference. And I also think that there's a lot of neurocognitive effects that we're probably, uh, we're, you know, at least for me as a neurosurgeon, my, my neurosurgically normal exam is, uh, is not a very intense neurocognitive evaluation. And I think when we're taking out, you know, to, taking out brain that's minimally involved with pathology, we're, we're probably doing something to those patients that um, is not beneficial. So I have moved a little bit away from that. That being said, you know, a small tumor in a non-dominant temporal lobe in a young person, you know, small medium, uh, I'll certainly take, you know, a pretty aggressive margin. Um, the idea that I think that may still offer them some life benefit, survival benefit. Good. You have the panel here, Dr. Paulo Cadre. Paulo Cadre is a Brazilian neurosurgeon. He spent a lot of time in, in Little Rock after he is in Turkey with Professor Yashagil. He will be one of the co-authors of the Yashagil next book. Not co-authors, he's just doing the work, yeah, Paulo? <laughs> helper, helper. <laughs> Yeah, help. Okay. What the concept of Professor Shalgil about the, the GBM that the, the lesion is located is the fibers in this supramarginal resection for low grade glioma. What Professor Yashagil think? Well, Professor Yashagil used to divide the in compartments the brain, right? So two big ways was the male cortical and the arc and paleocortical compartment. He used to say that uh, intrinsic lesions, they spread the fibers apart instead of going through them uh, like, uh, like a pathway. So uh, at least at the beginning, even the GBMs, they would be restricted to a certain compartment. That's why he favored what he called the pure lesionectomy not a supra total margin of re resection, but to remove the lesion itself and leave the brain as much as you can alone. So that's the basic concept of uh, philosophy. But for, for high grade also? At the beginning also, he says, he used to say that the, the behavior of the tumor would go wild, especially after you touch or after the radiotherapy. But at the beginning, 
even the GBMs, they would be confined in the certain compartments and you should respect these, uh, these compartments to plan your surgery. Thank you. I don't know if there is more question here, Dr. Leonardo, I think to Dr. Shumlis. Brian, please. Yes. And where is, oh, Dr. Natal. Um, Dr. Natal is a prominent Mexican neurosurgeon. <laughs> Let's go ahead, Dr. Natal. Uh, I, I, I want to it. ask, yeah, yeah. I want to <laughs> ask uh, Paulo Cadri, uh, because I, I have never seen a uh, more beautiful resection of the gliomas, uh, GBMs like Dr. Yasserfield. So I am in agreement with uh, his says, but how can you transmit to the neurosurgeons, especially young neurosurgeons, the technique to deal with this, such a, a beautiful dissection that uh, Professor Yasserfield makes in the GBMs? For GBM is for low grade also, you see. Yeah. How's the trick? How's the trick? Oh, I, he, cut, I mean... he cut the MRI? He cut the MRI? <laughs> <laughs> Looks like he take the, the MRI and cut. Look. Yeah. yeah. You know, like, uh, <laughs> and also, also, the sound, eh? Pro Professor Ture, he's also doing a beautiful, beautiful work in with uh, intrinsic tumors. So, for those who, who met Professor Asher Gil, or saw him operating, I would say that. He combined everything. He combined the visual feeling, the, 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 the touch feeling. He combined it, everything to the point that he used to say that even the sound of the aspirator was different between what was normal white matter and what was tumor. So it was a lot of information, a lot of training, a lot of experience. So there was not... Uh, a single trick. 5,000 5, gliomas, yeah? yeah? I mean, there is not, there, there is not like a one trick that do this and you're going to be safe. I mean, it was the combination of all of the factors. No, no, Edgar. Edgar, let's tell you something. One day I was in Little Rock. I, I spent Little Rock 93 to 96. Professor Yasha Gil arrived there in 94. I spent almost two years seeing his surgery, and he was editing the, the videos also. And one day he was editing the video and, and I start to, to watch him. And he said, oh, here is the putamen. I have no idea. <laughs> and he dissect, it was green. It was completely different. I never found. I tried to find, <laughs> I never <laughs> found. But that day in the video I saw, I don't know if the experience make this difference for 5,000 gliomas. And in every case, he always are saying, every case is different. In every case you learn, see? In every case there is something that you need to learn. And he was looking his own videos. See, what he was doing, the movement, tried to fix his, his own movements. That time he was 80, 80. Eight something or say eight times. He was looking his video. I have to change this, I have to change that. Now he's 96, in his mind is still very bright, very bright. Actually, so, today, today is his birthday. Yeah, yeah, I know, I know. 96 today. today. <laughs> 96 today. Great, great, great. No, no, so there is more question here to Dr. Uh, Dr. Dr. Thank you. Wonderful presentation. See, for us, you are the future. <laughs> you believe that your work will change the world. Today you are, you are still doing almost the same re the result that coaching. <laughs> Maybe in the future it will be much better than this. Professor Juan Luis Gomez Amador from Na National Institute of Mexico. Dr. Sure. Diego Mendes Rosito just said that we should sell the microscope. You don't need more microscope for pituitary surgery. He is right or not? Yeah. Uh, really not. I, 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 that he show. I can take with the microscope. You know? no, it's okay. Go no, ahead, go ahead, please. I, I would like to thank Diego. He, he just presented what the real uh, neurosurgery is. So in, in the recent times, 
uh, we have seen Prevedelo, James Kiliu, Garner, etc. Great guys in, uh, in topic surgery, performing very nice microsurgical dissections using the conventional dorsolateral approaches. So I, I think the neurosurgeon must have the skills to have a microsurgical or endoscopic resection of a, of a specific pathology, in this case, uh, pituitary tumors, using both techniques. The most important thing is to have the wisdom uh, for when, when you need to use a specific technique in, for, 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 uh, for a specific case. Uh, there are some points of controversy regarding the invasion of, I mean, the real invasion or, or pseudo invasion of the cavernous sinus, in which uh, right now we have a specific techniques and tools to, to perform a complete removal of a tumor inside the cavernous sinus. Pituitary tumors are usually soft tumors that can be easily taken out from, from every compartment. Uh, just recently, we, we, are, we are going to publish a, an article concerning the removal of uh, uh, tumors uh, compromising the cavernous sinus. And there are specific routes that you can follow using the endoscopic and nasal approach, similar as the one described by Dolenge in, uh, in the last century for the epidural approach using his uh, uh, peeling of the middle fossa technique to take out the tumors in this region. Diego presented with very large tumors extending dorsally and also laterally. So we can see that pituitary tumors is a very complex disease. It can be a very easy case, central, cellular, soft tumor, or it could be a very complex, like the tumor that he presented in the middle fossa uh, and also in the, in the cellular region. I, I, I want to congratulate Diego for, for his excellent presentation, but more than the presentation, we would like to thank him because he is showing, uh, as, as we have said before, that the neurosurgeon needs to use both the endoscope and the microscope whenever it's needed. Thank you, Diego. Thank you. Uh, you have here Dr. Walter Jean. Hello. 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 Walter, how are you? Good to see I'm, you I'm here. I'm great. Thank you. Brian here, Clemmer here. Uh, the endoscopic surgery for pituitary tumor is a standard of care today in the US or is there is a people still using the microscope for regular pituitary tumor, very small tumor. I know that Dr. Shambles, they've used a lot of micros, uh, endoscope. She, she did a fellowship with Charlie Steele, the good friend of us. He was in Little Rock that time, you know? I, I think... I, I think that's the, the, the endoscope. Ahead, is, the, the endoscope is getting more to be uh, the standard of care, although some people still use the microscope. I, I, I I'm, I'm flattered that you invited me to to join your panel, and and I feel like a very smart man because you and I both invited Diego for the same week to talk in our webinar. So mm -hmm. I, I make sure that everybody knows that Thursday Diego is going to be talking, showing his masterful work once again, uh, but this time for the North American Skull Base Society webinar on Thursday morning. So I'm, I feel very smart that we invited the same people. I'm, I must be very smart if I'm like you. Um, but I do have one comment about Diego's work. It is masterful stuff and it's mesmerizing to, to watch that on video. Uh, on the one hand, I think young neurosurgeons need to know that you do need to ha know how to handle the medial wall of the cavernous sinus. You do need to know how to, when to be aggressive uh, around the carotid. You do need to know how to do the uh, extra marginal, extra capsular dissection as uh, introduced by Oldfield for uh, Cushing's disease. However, just like Juan Luis just said, I wanna emphasize, it's when to apply those techniques that the young neurosurgeons really, really, really need to know. You, you should not take those kind of risks and, and, and do those aggressive resections in certain situations. Uh, you know, uh, and, and when to apply those very aggressive techniques and take those risks in near and around the cavernous sinus is what you really need to know. And, and even, even as masterful as Diego's uh, presentation was, he still showed you that sometimes you have to leave tumor behind because it's around the perforators. And if you try to get that out, you're gonna kill the patient or maim them. So uh, by all means for young neurosurgeons, don't get frightful about the medial wall and the car carotid and whatnot. But on the other hand, you really need to know when to apply those techniques because they are not universally uh, uh, necessary or applicable. 
Brian, in your practice, I know in the mass general, one of the most famous Twitter center in the world. See, Nicholas Zerber was the chairman a long time ago. Yeah, I think he was a, um, a master in pituitary surgery. How is how was this? He's changing from microscope to endoscope. If somebody's doing doing the microscope, it's a, it's a great question. I think we've been really lucky at Mass General to have uh, Zervis and then Dr. Smirnjian, who probably has one of the largest collections of uh, patients operated transfemorally using the microscope, and still to this day does. I think. Um, we have access to the intraoperative MRI as well as our ENT colleagues who can help with some of the endoscopic approaches. Um, and he decides, uh, and the, the effort is basically decided upon as to whether or not uh, one will do it traditionally through the microscope or with the endoscope or with the MRI. Um, and I think it all depends, as, as um, Dr. Jean had mentioned, it's all very specific to the actual patient, the pathology, and what exactly needs to be done. Um, Certainly, I think, as Lola had uh, mentioned, as well as others, and Diego, obviously, the videos were amazing. Um, I would say that, obviously, uh, the endoscopic approach does strike me as uh, certainly on the newer end, but uh, it's sort of in the best hands of the surgeon and the best pathology as to what we choose. Thank you. Now you, Dr. Ginto. You and me are the old guys here. See? <laughs> That's, I agree with you. <laughs> I agree with you. We are the old guys because, uh, well, my particular opinion is that uh, in the regular pituitary adenoma, I mean the standard adenoma, there is no any difference, any advantage of the endoscope in comparison to the microscope. But there are some differences. I'm always discussing with the endoscopist, as, as Dr. Juan Luis, discussing in a, in a good terms, of course, that endoscopy is not microsurgery. It, it, you always say in that endoscopy is microsurgery made through an endoscope. But no, <laughs> the, the typical point of, endo, of microsurgery oh, it has to follow some, some specific points like ergonomic, er ergometrics position, by manual uh, manipulation of the, of the tissue, a three-dimensional uh, 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 approach. So it's totally different. When we understand that there are two different techniques, you have to, of course, young neurosurgeons have to, to, to use, to learn how to use both of them. But let's start saying that my, the endoscope is a microsurgery applied to an endoscope is a different technique. I would say that the main advantage of endoscope in, in, in pituitary adenomas is just the invasion of the cavernous sinus. Of course, the direction of the microscope entering to the, to the surgical field, you cannot see, uh, uh, I mean, comfortable, the medial wall of the cavernous sinus and the, and the, and the carotid. Even if you drill, of course, the space is more reduced than the endoscope. Than the endoscope. But those, just in those cases is the only real, in my personal opinion, the real advantage of endoscopy. So it, there are just a few cases in which you have to approach, really approach. I mean, in which cases is justified to open the cavernous sinus in a small tumor that is remaining here is a benign lesion that can be observed and can be treated with another kind of treatment without damaging the one risk the patient so this is my my main argument is not uh, justified to open the cavernous sinus in every single case that you see real or partial or or or, or a pseudo invasion to the cavernous sinus may I have a, a comment please uh, con concerning the the address of uh, professor ginto I, I can no, no, no agree better with him. But uh, in, in the beginning of the learning curve of the endoscopic endonasal techniques, usually one think that he's doing uh, a special and different technique. But afterwards, when, when you are <clears throat> advancing in your learning curve, for example, when we are taking out the middle wall of a cavernous sinus, for example, or when, when we are treating intrinsic lesions of the pons, for example, you realize that what you're doing is, is precisely micro surgery. We are using both hands for the dissection. We have a great illumination in, in the surgical field. And uh, 
the, the sense of three dimensionality that you lack in the beginning is gained through the learning curve. So for example, at the beginning, it's difficult to, to have the sense of depth in, in the surgical field. But after many cases, you become very familiar with this. And, and then you're, you're able to, uh, through the, through the proprioception, to have the feeling of three dimensional uh, sense. So I, I, I think this is a real microneurosurgical technique because microneurosurgical technique is not only the microscope in the, in the, in the operative field, it's also the philosophy. Deep anatomical knowledge and the sense of three-dimensionality and the courage to perform the, the different actions that you need to take in, in a tumor. For example, in, in the case of uh, in, invasion of the cavernous sinus, we have uh, two very different groups. The real invasion of the cavernous sinus and the pseudo invasion of the cavernous sinus. We performed a study uh, uh, maybe three years ago in which we were trying to differentiate the real uh, cavernous sinus invasion and, and to take the tumors out of the region. When? When you have a patient with the acromegaly, for example, or, or very rare Cushing's disease, then you, you, are, you are impelled to take out the complete tumor and, and not, not to leave any, any tumor behind because of the biochemical consequences of this. And uh, as, as I said before, now we have the tools and the, and the techniques to take out the tumor from all the compartments of the cavernous sinus as, as, as Diego showed us in, in the previous cases. So I, I think it's possible. Not every case needs, needs to, to have an opening of the cavernous sinus because in the first place, most of the, of the pituitary tumors do not really invade the cavernous sinus. They make just uh, like a bulging portion compressing the cavernous sinus aside. So the tumor is really in the cellular region, right? And uh, uh, for, for those cases, we don't need to, to go inside the cavernous sinus. For a pituitary tumor uh, with, with a non-functional behavior, you don't need to go to the cavernous sinus. You can take most of the tumor that you can without uh, endangering the patient. And in this respect, we, we perform a series of cases uh, using neuromonitoring for the oculomotor nerves. And we've seen that uh, there is no uh, oculomotor damage after performing a wide dissection inside the cavernous sinus. So when, when you need to go is when you have a patient with a non-functioning uh, pituitary adenoma with cavernous sinus uh, symptoms, when you have a patient with a functioning lesion like a chromegaly or rarely the uh, Cushing's disease, these are, these, are the, these, these are, I think, the proper indications to perform a radical surgery in this region. Fernandez Miranda is, is doing a radical resection of the medial wall of the cavernous sinus almost in every case. And he, he shows that uh, he has, uh, in most of the cases, uh, pathologic findings uh, compatible with pituitary adenoma in the medial wall of a cavernous sinus. So this is a very particular case. And I think we need to be very aggressive with uh, functioning tumors and uh, more conservative with non-functioning tumors uh, and differentiate the pseudo invasion and real invasion of the cavernous sinus. But particularly functioning functioning tumors is almost impossible to cure when, it, when they invade the, invade the cavernous sinus with a real invasion of the cavernous sinus. Even if we see a, a, a clean MRI, if we check strictly the criteria of cure of uh, Cushing disease and acromegaly, I, I, I do, do not believe a, a real cure of a patient with invasion to the cavernous sinus because the whole papers and the whole world says, says, says that. So it's, it's almost impossible to cure a patient with real invasion to the cavernous sinus. So why to uh, uh, submit those patients to this risk if we know uh, uh, before that the patient is not going to be cured? In, in real terms, I'm talking in the real uh, current criteria of cure in Cushing's disease and in acromegaly. And in those cases, the medical treatment has a, a, better, a better response than, of course, if you are, uh, you are making only a decompression of the tumor and give the patient the medical treatment is the same result as, uh, as uh, making a more radical uh, resection because uh, there are, in sciences, there is no uh, uh, publication with enough, uh, uh, um, um, I mean, uh, sustained, to affirm that they can cure all patients with functional tumors with invasion to the cavernous sinus. 
neither microsurgery <laughs> or endoscopy techniques okay. look, look for a complete cure of, of the patients. But if we analyze the series uh, recently published by uh, Todo Schwartz, the same for Miranda, they are achieving better results with the time. I think it's too okay. early to say to say if it's going to be the standard uh, technique for these patients. I think it's maybe too early to to say that. I I have said about P Twitter. It's a, you want to see your results? Don't ask the surgeon. Ask the endocrinologist. He yeah. knows your results. <laughs> ask them, not ask for the surgeon. Okay. I think the cavernous sinus is not a big a big deal. The problem you can go to the cavernous sinus. Maybe the big deal is the approach that you use. You use a difficult approach to go through the nose to cavernous sinus lateral to the ICA. It's not the correct way. My baby, you don't need. In our experience in acromegaly, you have more than 100 cases of acromegaly, almost zero of cavernous sinus invasion. Almost zero. Cavernous sinus invasion, acromegaly. Cure. Very almost almost zero is very low. Okay. <laughs> Uh, but ask the endocrinologist, he will show your results. <laughs> okay. Professor Apion Tunis, go ahead, please. Uh, well, <clears throat> uh, first of all, congratulations to both presenters, Dr. Lola and Dr. Diego. Fantastic and very elegant presentations. I'm going to leave one question to Dr. Lola and one question to Dr. Diego. But before that, I would like to say that I don't think there's any importance if one thinks about microsurgery or endoscopic surgery. If you do get good results, do it. That's enough. I am at the time when I started doing pituitary surgery through microsurgery. And then I went on to endoscopic surgery. So if you do good, get good results with microsurgery, that's enough. Show your results and that's okay. Uh, one question, Dr. Lola, is I've done it a week ago to another Webby seminar. I've been watching patients with glioblastoma for the last 40 years. And we have now beautiful post-operative results and the morbidity very, very small. But what can you foresee for the next short future of to change the survival of at around 15 months that we see for every patient? This is for you. And for Diego, please, Diego, fantastic presentation. Uh, according to the opening the covenant sinus, if we have non-secreting tumors, do you usually try to open this covenant sinus or you just don't go, you leave a piece, you follow this patient and in case of growth, you will send this patient for a radio surgery. Thank you. Dr. Oh, Lola. Thank you for that challenging questions. Um, you know, I, I think the one thing we can be sure of is, is as you've said, I think we're, we're doing as a group, as a community, we're doing glioma surgery as well as we know how to at this point, And we're using a wide variety of adjunctive tools to do that. Uh, and I think we're getting close to the limits of what surgical resection can do uh, to influence the outcome of glioma patients. Um, obviously there's more nuance that can always be added, but I don't think that we are going to see a major shift in the way that we resect those tumors in the next 10 or 20 years. Uh, but what I do think is, is going to change the face of glioma treatment ultimately is targeted therapy to the cells of either origin or the cells that, uh, that, that stimulate recurrence. And the challenge there is that, you know, this is such, um, is a disease that has so much molecular heterogeneity uh, that we really don't have a handle at all on what those mutations or what those sp specific cells are. Um, in my lab, we're excited about the concept that the SVZ has a role there, uh, and certainly it may, that, that may be simply a supportive role to some other process that we don't fully understand. But I think we're going to be looking at targeted gene therapy uh, if I had to guess <laughs> what, what will make, what will be the difference maker, um, and figuring out not just what those targets are, but also how to then deliver that therapy in a way that gets it to, um, all of these cells, which we know are fairly diffuse throughout the brain is going to be the, the secondary challenge. And that's probably going to be up to us as the surgeons. 
Thank you. Diego. Yes. Thank you very much, Dr. Apio, for, for the question. Uh, I completely agree what we what you are saying about uh, doing what is best for you and your results. It's just a matter of time, of, of time, of era, in a way. It's not, uh, uh, I think, I strictly think that all new generations should be trained with the combination of, 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 of open and the microscope and also the endoscope. Why? Because it's another tool, simply as that. It's not that it is better here or the other, it's what you can do. And it's just another tool in, other, in your armamentarium. So I find the, not uh, that saying about defend the indefensible, you cannot defend the microscope in, 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 one of those, in, in one of those cases. It's just another tool. Regarding the cavernous sinus, uh, as, as Dr. Lola said previously, if the tumor takes you there, you are there. It's it's not, it's, yeah, if, it, if the tumor takes you there, uh, 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 we are, we are uh, uh, there to take the most that we can. We are not going to take any, any extra risk uh, uh, we know that we have the radio surgery, for example, in cases uh, where, where it's needed, but we are always going to try to take out the most tumor that you can take out safely. And so that is very important. And another thing is that today with the training in, in laboratories and, and cadaver dissections, it is so important in order to obtain the experience, the touch, the sense, and to do training in the lab in order to, to do these approaches. Sometimes some people say, oh, you don't have to do that big approach for that. It's not that you're doing a big approach. It's simply, simply removing the, the most uh, bone that you can take out to take out the tumor safely. So I do think it's part of the training that every young surgeon should have. And if it's already an experienced surgeon, you can acquire the, 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 the curve, learning curve. So uh, I, I find it very, very useful to combine both techniques, the endoscope, which is a microsurgical technique because you are using illumination, magnification, uh, microsurgical movement, anatomy. It is microsurgical technique. Thank you. May I have a question? Is microsurgery real microsurgery is my is microsurgery if illumination by endoscope is the in the cavernous science give you the route if you go there but sometimes you don't need to go sometimes there is a small piece you cannot get the problem is the protein to use <laughs> professor Soriano, go ahead. Yeah. Well, just to complement my talk is to say that dr barb is talking about this because he's married to an endocrinologist that's the reason no no no, no <laughs> who take care of my patient the endocrinologist the results are completely different. Talk with me. <laughs> you are 100% removal or 100% cure. If you go to a endocrinologist, it will be 50. It will be yeah, 60. You're right. It sometimes pushed. it's a matter of time. I was telling about my cushion. I have a series of cushions where we're just preparing to publish now. One year, 80%, 80%, 84%. I was very happy. Two years, 60, 70. Five years, 50%. For me, it's cure. One year is cure. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Let's make this make the difference. It's a multidisciplinary team. It's very important when you treat pituitary lesion. It's very important. The neuroendocrine team is very important. Professor Soriano, please. Dr. Diego Mendez, congratulations. Fantastic talk. Uh, Considering both approaches with microscope and endoscope uh, in similar cases, you are talking about the ability to, to resect them. But my question is, what about the approach itself? What about the consequences for the, for the, for the endonasal approach? It's absolutely different, the approach at the beginning, and what about the complication, the intranasal complications, comparing microsurgical 
versus endoscopic approach. Because I think there is some difference, right? Diego? Yes, uh, definitely there. Uh, yes, definitely. Thank you for the question. Uh, we like uh, to to use the grand majority of the times the, to, to go together with the ENT team in order to have a, a well reconstruction. It, it is part of the training of the training and the learning curve to understand, uh, uh, to have a good plan of the surgery. And, uh, and, uh, and uh, like I showed in, uh, in one of those cases, the first case it was, uh, we had a, a, a nasoceptal flap it was a rescue flap. And in the other one, it was a, a established uh, nasoceptal flap. So it is part of the, of the training uh, of, the, of the young neurosurgeons neuro uh, that uh, the reconstruction of the, of, of, the, of, the, of the surgical region. But yes, I completely agree. And it's important to, to have a good ENT team together with you. Thank you. You know, if they, they have more questions here from the panelists. From... Uh, somebody asked him about the closure, Dr. Diego. If in case of diaphragma seal weak, it's necessary to insert fat. You feel fat, the cavity? Uh, no, oh, close. Depends. Uh, we usually, what we do is that we usually, if it's a high flow or a low flow CSF leak, uh, on, it depends on that. Uh, but we usually use more uh, a nasoceptal flap and, and some of the duragen and some of the hemostatics of, 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 uh, to, to cover it. But not, uh, not in a routine basis, we don't use, uh, sometimes we use fascia lata in order when we have a high leak, uh, high grade uh, CSF leak, in order to complete it uh, with uh, some durogen, fasciolata, and with the nasoceptal flap. I want to make one question, maybe the last question here, maybe, or Brian want to say something to Dr. Shambles. We spent one year, of, uh, one year, yeah, or more in. In Australia, of Charlie Steele? Uh, just under a year. OK, no, no, no. Charlie Steele is very aggressive surgery in, in every kind of protein that he does. And he does something that is amazing. And it's a lot of things that is very controversial. Uh, you cannot not talk about controversy. <laughs> OK? We'll stay the whole night here to talk about the controversy of Charlie Steele. <laughs> there is. One limit for endoscopy in the Charlie Steele view, he say, oh, this I cannot do it. Because he, he's coming to here to take a convex meningioma sometimes. That's it. But there is one area, I'm, I'm joking. <laughs> okay. This one area that say, this area, I cannot go. Do you remember this? <laughs> mm -hmm. Um, I mean, I think, you know, certainly we would discuss that in some of his brainstem tumor surgery. Um, is that what, but I don't know if that's what you're referring to. I might, I don't know. He might've given up saying there's a place he can't go by the time I got there. <laughs> <laughs> What's your recollection? No, I have no idea. Oh, okay. <laughs> when, I met, when I met him, he was pediatric surgeon. He was doing myeloma meningocele and shunts. After he becomes famous with endoscope, Juan Luis knows him very well. Uh, uh, he's a great surgeon, great guy. Great I, was guy, great guy. I was there in 2012, um, so some time ago, but not that long ago. And and I'll say, you know, I was I was actually somewhat surprised that um, we didn't use the endoscope quite as much as I might have imagined from afar. He had a very balanced approach uh, to to what type of technology to use based on the, the goals of any particular case. Um, and that's what I try to do as well. Uh, you know, I think one thing that I learned from him is that if you wanna get comfortable using the endoscope early, you have to use it a lot um, just because the haptics are so different. 
And so, for example, um, pulling it out and using it to look at cases that I might have otherwise just done microscopically you know, through craniotomies uh, and, and really forcing myself to use the endoscope as an assistant to look around corners um, sped me up. And as he also taught me, it sped up my team's uh, ability to just get that technology there. Uh, and so I do think it's important sometimes at the beginning of your practice to really push yourself to continue to use it, uh, even when you could probably get away without it. And then as you narrow your practice, you really hone in on what is most valuable for you. You may you generally you are going to find that for a given case, you probably use one or the other technique. The thing that I'm playing with now a little bit yeah. is the exoscope, which is a whole different um, whole different experience. And I'm I'm now feeling like uh, you know someone who's having a whole new method of surgical illumination <laughs> brought to me. Uh, I now <laughs> understand what my mentors were going through when I was learning about endoscopy and they were learning about it as faculty as well, because it's very hard to, to force yourself to use something that feels different when you have a, a good way of doing it, um, you know, but you think that there's a reason to try something new. Next time I will bring Dr. Charles Steele and Dr. Almefti here, it will be very nice. <laughs> In the pandemic, it's time will be wonderful because we'll be far away. They can fight a lot. There is no, <laughs> cannot be closer. Brian, can you say something? Uh, now it's 8 p.m. here. It's 6 p.m. in Boston or 7 p.m. in Boston? Seven. Can you say something that you can close? You have the whole week. <laughs> yes. Uh, first of all, thank you to the 370 people that were logged in at one point. This has uh, just been an amazing discussion. Dr. Borba, I love doing this with you because you're so engaging and you certainly bring out the uh, controversy. To Diego and Lola, that was an amazing presentation um, and very insightful. It kicked off a fantastic week. Uh, we look forward to the whole week of presentations. I do want to take a special moment to thank Medtronic, who's been sponsoring uh, a lot of the uh, ability for us to do this. To everyone who's logged in from both the Brazilian and the Mexican societies, I look forward to seeing you guys every night this week. And certainly feel free, if you're in Boston, feel free to ring me. Obviously, if you're in Vanderbilt, ring Lola and anybody at the CNS. And, I, and we will do the same. And hopefully, we can come down to the next SBN or flank meeting uh, next year. Thank you. Thank you. Nashville is nice. Eh? Nashville is very nice. <laughs> <laughs> well, Tomorrow well. is the vascular. We have Dr. Oh, Ferris Vasco, Vasco, yes, and Clement yeah, well, moderating it. Tomorrow we will stand everybody. Yeah. No more yeah, this all, open heads kind of stuff tomorrow. that Dr. Ferris will like, like to do. Everybody for the for the inside the channel. Okay. <laughs> Maybe right. if, uh, if somebody wanna say something, you tomorrow yeah. be here. Dr. Clever, tomorrow, yeah. Yeah, tomorrow, you. same time, we have Dr. Brian Jankovitz and Dr. Felix Paul talking about aneurysm treatments and various uh, ways of doing this, uh, mostly endovascular, but not limited to that, also about clipping. And we're hoping to see even more people tomorrow. Dr. Felix, tomorrow, you, you are the old generation. Let's see what you can do. You have to convince me to open the... Open the head, you have to convince me. Okay. <laughs> okay. Up you. And what we're thank you. As Drubo as you, well. Everybody. Where is Asdrubo? Asdrubo? Well, Drubo went to put some screw there. Okay. <laughs> He'll screw somebody there. Okay. <laughs> Thanks. Bye bye. Thank okay. you. Thank, thank you. 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 Ahora si estamos so, solo nosotros podemos hablar alguna cosa aquí. Vamos a hablar en español. En español, en español, sí, sí, está bien. Diego, Muchas parabéns. Muchas gracias, Pablo. Muchas gracias. Gracias. Muy bien, defensor gracias. de la... Uy. Eh, es sí, bonito. Sí. sí, ok. Generó un poco de discusión ahí, que si el endoscopio, que si el... No, la cosa... No, yo quería hacer broma, hacer aquí, hacer discusión. Si no hay discusión, no tiene gracia, ¿no? Tiene que, tiene que hacerlo. Y Roberto Leal está acá con, con la fotito y no abrió hasta ahora. ¿eh? Oh, Roberto. Ay, apareció a Margarita. Yo. Hola, Roberto. Hola, Roberto. Hace el micrófono, hace el micrófono.
Ah, sem microfone? Agora foi, agora foi. Okay. Não, já estava, não? Mas, é. Dieguito, muito boa a apresentação. Que... Muito obrigado. Mas, eu tenho que sair um pouquinho aqui. Um abraço a todos. Isso abraço. que é como, como o Apio né, disse, né, que eh, nós fazíamos por craniotomia, não? mas agora, ahorita, podemos fazer por endoscopia também dois, tecnic, dois técnicos, não? muito melhor. Não? A boba e, 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 também vai aderir isto, não? Essa é questão de tempo, porque é, o endocrinologista me dizia que o resultado era bom, buenos, mas ahorita é mais é, é melhor, não? Yo como lo veo es una herramienta más, una herramienta más para tener mejor visibilidad. Ya, sí, 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 sí. Parabéns, buenas noches para usted, gente. Buenas noches, Paulo. Un abrazo. Chao, profesor. Bueno, José, mucho gusto verte. Sale Roberto, gusto verte. Ah, sí, sí. sí ¿Qué onda, Diego? Ya, ya lo Gracias, dije, doctor. ¿no? Já lo disse, muito buenos, não? parabéns, não? congratulations. Muito obrigado, saludos, doutor Natal, adeus, boa noite. Saludos, boa noite. Boa noite. Bye.